order of business, we need to address some troublesome comments we've been getting about the skits. Oh yeah? What's that? If this has to do with killing the old man too much, that's bullcrap. We haven't killed the old man in quite some time. Yeah, we've we've even been really nice to him lately too. Well, actually, I've been subjected repeatedly to discrimination for my tendency to turn simple, succinct statements into long, tedious- That's quite enough out of you. Stow it. No, this has to do with the rogue. Apparently there are some viewers who don't like his high-pitched voice. They find it annoying. Oh, really? Well, where are these people making these comments? You can't solve everything with violence, um, you know. Actually... Unfortunately, we've come to the decision that the rogue will need to be removed from the group, effective immediately. What? Really? What the crap? This sucks! Indeed, we, we can't just capitulate the demands of the vocal minority on social media. Yeah, yeah, what what kind of company has a business model where they let the loud mouthed idiots on Twitter tell them what to do? I'm really sorry, everybody, but our beloved rogue has been axed by unpopular demand. Holy crap! I've been screwed! Welcome to the DM Lair. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a dungeon master since high school. On this channel, I give practical game master advice that you can use in your Dungeons and Dragons games. Today in the Lair, we're gonna be talking about removing players from your D&D or RPG games. Specifically, I'm going to hit eight indicators that it might be time to remove a player from your game, how to remove a player from the game, and four pitfalls of removing players from the game. So we're gonna be covering lots of ground today. If you're a game master looking to reduce your prep time, but still run amazing games for your players, check out Lair Magazine at the link below. The July issue, Fire and Feast, is available now, and it contains two 5th edition D&D adventures, complete with maps for use on virtual tabletops. The Temple of Two Dragons for level 7, and the Shattered Lair of Mount Fallow for level 12. It also contains 10 traps, 5 puzzles, 10 new spells, 10 new monsters, 4 new subclasses, and 10 adventure ideas. My Patrons get a new issue of Layer Magazine every month, and they also get bonus content. In July, they get a map pack with 10 maps designed for virtual tabletop use, and a city tile pack with 20 different tiles they can use to create their own city maps. You can become a DM Layer patron at the link below to immediately get access to both June and July issues of Layer Magazine. And then every month you get more DM resources to use in your games. Eight indicators that it might be time to remove a player from the group. Number one, when the player is no longer contributing positively to the gaming environment. This is my overarching rule. A player must contribute positively to the gaming environment. This means that the game is better off because of that player's presence. If a player brings the game down, leaves it worse off due to their presence, if you think it would make your game better if they left, it might be time to remove them from the group. Now, I had a player once, uh, we'll just call him Beavis for our purposes here. Uh, he, he, I will be talking about him quite a bit during this video, by the way, he, but in, he brought the game down for everyone because of his power gaming and cheating. The game was not better off because of his presence, but it was far worse off because of his presence. Number two, good players start leaving the game because of another player. This is a huge indicator that you'd better do something fast if you want to keep your good players around. The last thing you want is to lose all the good players and be stuck with the bad player. Now you don't necessarily have to wait for players to start leaving. If there is general discontent and players are complaining to you, the dungeon master, about another player, that's a warning sign. You'd better try to resolve the issue before they start leaving. However, a word of warning. Be wary of players who will try to manipulate you, the Dungeon Master, by threatening to leave if you don't do X, Y, or Z. Players might do this. There is a big difference between several players not liking a single player, grumbling about it, and considering leaving, and a player or other players intentionally trying to manipulate you by threatening to leave. I, 
I can't tell you how to sense this, how to know if this is actually happening. You need to rely on your intuition and a good insight check, I guess. But just be aware that it can be a thing. Now, in my Sword Coast guard game, I had one of my best players, Aaron, leave the group temporarily because of another player. We'll call her Karen. Now, Karen was a rules lawyer and already known for getting into arguing matches with me, but one day Karen decided to lay into Aaron, essentially telling him he sucked as a player. This of course made Aaron a little bit upset and he left the game session. There was a little bit more discussion and things and then we all kind of disbanded and went home. Afterwards, I began talking with Karen, trying to explain to her, find out what's going on, having a conversation because her behavior was just not appropriate. Come to find out, she was just not gonna come and see light and I asked her to leave the game. This was based on that incident and a whole bunch of previous incidents incidences with Karen. Afterwards, I found out that Aaron had texted me and I somehow missed it. And he had said that he was leaving the game because of Karen. Now, of course, I had already kicked Karen out of the game. And so I told Aaron, hey, dude, she's gone. Uh, if you want to come back, there's a spot waiting for you. And he agreed. We got Aaron back and we all happily kept playing the game. In fact, our very next game session was one of our best game sessions ever. We were probably so relieved that Karen wasn't there that we just had the time of our lives. I don't know how else to explain it. Number three, when the dungeon master doesn't want to run the game anymore. <sighs> When dungeon masters find themselves not wanting to run the game because of a specific player, that's an indicator that something must be done. It doesn't really matter what that player is doing to strip your desire to run the game away, but if they leech your heart and soul for the game out of you and you stop running the game, everyone loses. It's better to remove one player who is sucking your love for the game out of you than for everyone to essentially be removed from the game when you decide to stop running it. Number four, when more time is spent arguing with the player or dealing with drama than playing the game. Your, your players, I'm gonna go on a limb here, I'm gonna go on a big limb here, but your players most likely signed up for D&D Night to you know, actually play D&D. So if you find yourself and another player constantly getting into it, often in the form of rules arguments from my experience, though it could be over anything, or if it's two other players arguing and causing drama, and these discussions and mini soap operas take up more of your four hour block of game time than playing the game does, do something. Most players want to play D&D, not watch a couple people go at it. For the average person, that's just not fun. It causes discomfort at the very least for most people. Now you might like watching MMA fights or something or boxing, That's but it's totally different when it's two people right there in your presence going at it. Uh, I don't know. Some of you might enjoy that. What do I know? Now, with my player Karen, this was definitely a thing. She was the classic rules lawyer, trying to find loopholes, technicalities, and vagueness in the rules to accomplish her objectives as a player and PC. This, of course, resulted in many long discussions in the game, many of which left me extremely annoyed and sometimes straight up pissed. Do you know how good a game I run when I'm annoyed or angry? Yeah, not very good. That means that not only did everyone suffer having to listen to us argue, but then everyone suffered afterwards because in my subsequent state of mind, I just wasn't running a good game. You know, for that matter, Beavis would do similar things that caused extended arguments about game rules, but he was coming from a power gaming perspective more than anything else. It's kind of related, but not quite the same thing. So if you have a player who is constantly arguing with you about rules or whatever, Trust me, it's almost assuredly affecting the other players and the game as a whole. Number five, when you've talked repeatedly with the player and their bad behavior isn't changing. Our first step as game masters when we have a problem player should always be to talk to them to try to resolve the situation. To get them to be a less problematic player that we don't have to remove from our game. However, Sometimes talking with them just doesn't help. Sometimes they just don't change their ways. In the case of Beavis, I met with him several times outside the game to discuss his behaviors. I say behaviors, plural, because there were several things he was doing that were causing issues in the game. We could talk about his tendency to wake up more of the dungeon during a fight. That is, everybody's already in a fight. He wanders off, opens the door, and brings down more monsters upon the party. He did this at least a couple times that I can recall offhand. Anyway, despite all our conversations and emails and text messages, he persisted in causing issues until 
One day, I snapped and couldn't take it any longer, and Beavis never returned to our game. My advice, if you've made repeated efforts to bring problematic behavior to a player's attention, ask them to desist, and given them suggestions for how they might behave instead, but they persist in their horrible ways, it's probably time to remove them from the group. Number six, when the player rarely makes game sessions. Game masters are curious creatures at times. On the one hand, we can ruthlessly crush a player's PC in the game. And on the other hand, we can patiently put up with a player who presents any number of excuses week after week of why they can't make a game session. Now, these excuses come in different flavors, but they usually boil down to one thing. The player essentially doesn't have time to play the game. Or I should more accurately say, they aren't willing to prioritize D&D over their other activities, leaving them with no time to play. And it doesn't matter if their other activities, work and family for instance, should be prioritized over the game or not. The bottom line is the player doesn't have time to play the game. And at my game table, if you don't have time to play the game, then you can't be a player in my game. <laughs> it's just logic. It's like, why would I reserve a spot at my table, which is a finite cap to the number of players, by the way, for a player who rarely comes? And then when they do come, we have to spend an hour explaining everything that's happened to get them caught up. They don't remember how their character features work, and we need to handhold them. Like, why should we do that? They might be a close friend or someone that I really care about, but if they don't have time to play, then I don't have time for them to be a player in the game. Also, my dear fellow game masters, please remember this too. Many times when someone doesn't want to do something at all, they give you an acceptable social excuse for not being able to do it. And that excuse almost always has to do with not having time. So, if you have a player who just never seems to have time to play, please consider that they might just be giving you that as a social excuse to not play the game because they don't want to hurt your feelings. The truth might be that they just don't like D&D and just don't want to play. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. The game is not for everyone. Number seven, when the player's play style isn't compatible with everyone else's. Hey. This happens. You might have a player who is a good person and an otherwise good player, but their play style isn't compatible with either the way you're running the game or with the other players' play styles. There are a variety of flavors to how this might manifest itself, of course. This player likes PvP and no one else does. The player loves talking in character and interacting with NPCs and other PCs while in character and using special voices. And he wants to do so for extended periods of time, but everyone else just wants to run combat heavy dungeon crawls and they usually just ignore or kill NPCs they come across. You see, no one is necessarily in the wrong here, but there is a clash of playstyles. Now, many times a game master can make everyone happy by including a variety of game elements in their game, but sometimes the differences in playstyle are extreme, and the one player who's different from everyone else just won't be happy in the game. And more than that, their wanting to play the game a different way can just throw a wrench in the entire group's fun. So, in some extreme cases, differing game styles could certainly be a reason to part ways. So, of course, amicably, I would say. Number eight, when the player's personality isn't compatible with everyone else's. Come on, guys, the game is about having fun. It's not about putting up with someone you don't get along with or who is annoying or whose presence you cannot stand. You don't get points for long suffering in D&D. Someone's personality might just not fit in with you or the rest of the group. Not everyone in the world can be friends, hang out, and enjoy games together. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means your personalities don't mesh together. You don't fit together, you clash, and it just might not work. This incompatibility happens most often when you invite a stranger to play the game or have your friends play, but some of them don't know each other yet. It's one thing to put up with a person who gets on your nerves at a convention game. I think we've all had to do that before, but week to week in your home game? No one should have to suffer through that. I, th that reminds me, I once had a player fill in during my Sword Coast Guard game, and this player was, he was a good natured person. He wasn't a bad person. He was just annoying as crap. He was annoying to me. I'm pretty sure my other players were annoyed by him, and we just couldn't stand him. 
at all. And I, I couldn't imagine having to keep on playing a game with him week after week after week. It just, it was not a good fit for the group. Now, I felt a little bad about it because he was a good guy, but I refused to subject myself or my players to that annoyingness, sorry, week after week by inviting him back. And this is exactly why I have an on-call system for players. Someday I probably need to do a video about that. And some of you are gonna be saying right now, oh, that's heartless, Luke. How can you possibly do that? Hey, I don't run D&D games to give the poor and destitute homes. I do it so me and my players can have fun. And if that's heartless, well, then I'm heartless. How to remove a player from the group. Number one, before removing someone from the group, try to resolve the issue first. Talk with them, explain what the player is doing that is problematic, explain how it's causing a problem and how it's making others feel, listen to their side of the story, and finally, ask the player to change the problematic behavior. There's four steps there all very strategic and key in helping you resolve an issue. And you might need to have some follow-up conversations too. Pet behaviors don't change overnight. However, just remember you're running a game and you aren't obligated to invest in the personal character development of the player over the long term. You are not responsible for making sure they become a productive and contributing member of society. So, if you talk with them a few times, but they don't change, call it a day. Your responsibility for their personal conduct is limited. You don't need to bend over backwards or spend months or years trying to get them to change their ways. Number two, if the player persists and they must needs be removed from the group, ask them to leave the group. This is like, this is pretty simple, right? It's not brain surgery. And some of you are like, but Luke, what do I say? But that's fair. This can be a very uncomfortable conversation. I totally get that. Hey, Karen, <laughs> I've been thinking about this and I know we talked a few times, but things just aren't changing and I don't think this is working out. I feel like the best thing for the game as a whole, for you and for the other players, is for us to part ways. Hey, Beavis. This isn't working out. I've talked with the other players and we all feel the best thing is for you to leave the game. Be direct. Don't beat around the bush. Just tell them what's up. Do it nicely, do it diplomatically, do it politely. Don't be a jerkwad, but be direct. But Luke, I don't deal with confrontations well. And it's certainly confrontational for most people to have to tell a player to leave the game. Okay, that's fair, so don't do it alone. Have some other players accompany you and help. What's to say that you as the dungeon master have to be the only one that goes in there to face that? Have some people help you. But Luke, when do I do this? If possible, don't do it during your game. That will put a downer on the entire game session. You'll have to like wait for the person to leave, pack up their stuff and go home. It's gonna be very awkward and uncomfortable. So I suggest doing it outside of the game. Does it have to be in person, face to face? Come on, you're not breaking up with your fiance of 20 years. <laughs> you're not disowning your only child. You're removing a player from the game. This is not a monumental earth shattering thing here. An email or a text message will suffice. Is it better to do it in person? Maybe, but oftentimes we just don't see our players outside of the game itself. And remember, you don't want to ruin a game session over this. So an email might just have to do. Number four, pitfalls of removing a player from the group. All right, let's talk about some things not to do. Number one, disbanding the entire group with a lame excuse and then secretly reassembling it without the problem player. This, this is what dungeon masters without guts do. Have some guts, don't do this. And besides, do you think your player is not gonna find out anyway? Number two, not removing a player for reasons. Now, reasons themselves will abound, but the most common ones I've heard are these. They are a friend and I'll hurt the relationship. And they are family, I'll hurt the relationship. I 100% acknowledge that those are difficult positions to be in. Knowing that the best thing for the game would be to remove Jim Bob, but also knowing that doing so will hurt your relationship with him. Now, what many dungeon masters do in this situation is just put up with the problematic behavior and watch as their D&D game dies a slow death. 
as it sputters and grinds on until it is finally abandoned. And then the DM laments the demise of their group, waits a couple of months spent in mourning, and then pieces back another group and campaign to continue playing, often composed of many of the original players minus the bad player. What a horribly tedious and painful for everyone way to go about this. Number three, putting up with a problem player for way longer than you should. This is gonna cause everyone much more suffering than it otherwise should. And it's hard, I know, because it's also sometimes much easier to tell after you remove a player that you should have done it sooner. In the moment, it's hard to judge when enough is enough. This happened with my player Beavis. I put up with him for far too long before I finally snapped and he left. Now, I know that 2020 hindsight vision is a thing, and it was hard to distinguish that in the moment, but after the fact, I really think he should have gone a lot sooner. Number four, not being direct with the player. Kind of already mentioned this, but basically not telling them what the issue is, not making it clear that they are being removed from the group. Don't beat around the bush, just tell them what's up. Be a big boy or girl, you can do it. Remember, if you'd like to reduce your prep time and improve your game, check out Layer Magazine at the link below. As a DM Layer patron, you'll get a new issue every month, plus a slew of other patron-only benefits. Also, don't forget to follow me over on Twitch where I have weekly live streams and answer your Game Master questions. If I finally convinced you to kick that guy from your gaming group, give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let you YouTube know what a cruel, heartless jerk I really am. And until next time, let's play D&D. &D.